Hey guys, tonight we are going to forget the chaos of the modern world and step back, way back, into a civilization that got one fundamental thing incredibly right, plumbing. Close your eyes for a second and really listen to the sound of your own home right now. Maybe it's the soft hum of your refrigerator, the distant rumble of traffic, or perhaps, if you're lucky, the gentle drip of a recently neglected faucet. Now imagine yourself not in your cozy 21st century dwelling, but standing on the sun-baked, precisely planned streets of a massive city 5,000 years ago. You trudge through the ancient city of Mohenjo-daro, dust rising lazily around your ankles. The air is thick, dry, and surprisingly clean. You look down a long straight avenue, noticing the perfect 90-degree angle where it meets the cross street. This isn't some haphazard settlement, but a city built with an architect's sharp ruler. As you pass a cluster of multi-story brick homes, you notice something truly startling right there in the street, something that shouldn't exist in the Bronze Age, a neatly covered brick-lined drain running parallel to the curb. It is a sealed sewer system, and this is 2600 BCE. You probably won't survive this level of chronological displacement without contracting at least a mild fever and a severe case of culture shock. Most civilizations of this era, Mesopotamia, Egypt, were dealing with sanitation via clay pots, open ditches, or let's be honest, just throwing it out the window. But the people of the Indus Valley Civilization, IVC, flourishing along the mighty Indus River in what is now modern Pakistan and Northwest India, were designing municipal systems that wouldn't be rivaled in sophistication until the Roman Empire, two millennia later. It's a mainstream historical fact that these cities, particularly Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, featured extensive and standardized drainage systems far surpassing their contemporaries. Imagine trying to keep a city of 40,000 people healthy without managing waste, the IVC folks weren't just thinking about convenience, they were thinking about public health, a concept we often attribute to far later eras. This leads us to a quirky tidbit. The standardization here wasn't just in the drains, but in the bricks themselves. Almost every brick found across all major IVC sites, used for houses, temples, and those vital drains, conformed to a precise one to two to four ratio, thickness to width, to length. It's like they had an OSHA standard operating procedure for every building material. Historians still argue whether this extreme standardization implies a centralized, perhaps even authoritarian governing structure, or if it was simply a highly efficient, decentralized cultural consensus on best practices. As you stumble past another perfectly constructed inspection hole on the main drain, you realize this level of engineering requires incredible foresight. It wasn't just, let's dig a hole. It was, let's calculate the perfect slope for efficient flow without causing erosion. And they did it, time and time again, across hundreds of miles of territory. So before you get comfortable, take a moment to like the video and subscribe, but only if you genuinely enjoy what I do here. If you're feeling chatty, drop your location and local time in the comments. I'd love to know where you're listening from. Now, dim the lights. Maybe turn on a fan for that soft background hum, and let's ease into tonight's journey together. The noise of the street fades as you walk up a steep, wide brick ramp toward the western mound, or the citadel, of Mohenjo-daro. Your destination is the most famous water structure in the entire civilization, a testament to their hydro-engineering prowess, the Great Bath. It's not flashy, covered in gold or guarded by sphinxes, it's quietly, intensely practical. As you peer down, you see a massive rectangular tank about 12 meters long and 7 meters wide. It's surrounded by a paved courtyard and colonnades. You carefully descend the flight of steps, slick with the dust of ages, towards the bottom of the tank. Feel the cool brickwork beneath your hand. The air here is different, heavy with history, and you can almost smell the faint, clean scent of the water that once filled this space. This is where a key piece of mainstream historical fact comes in. The Great Bath is a masterclass in watertight construction. The floor and sides of the tank were sealed using meticulously laid, 
finely dressed bricks set in gypsum mortar, and then, most crucially, a thick layer of natural bitumen, a tar-like waterproof substance, was sandwiched between the layers of brickwork. This wasn't just a pool, it was a complex engineering solution to prevent water leakage over an extended period. Imagine trying to seal a large swimming pool with nothing but ancient materials, and yet, they succeeded. Now for the quirky tidbit that adds to the mystery. While the Great Bath clearly served a public function, its exact purpose is still intensely debated. It wasn't necessarily a purely recreational pool. Given its location in the highly organized Citadel area, many historians suggest it was used for ritual bathing, perhaps a purification rite necessary for civic life or religious festivals. You look around, seeing the smaller rooms adjacent to the tank, perhaps changing rooms or small private steam areas. It suggests a level of bodily ritual and hygiene that is simply staggering for the age. It's a reminder that their concerns weren't just practical, but also spiritual and communal. The orthogonal grid that defines Mohenjo-daro, streets laid out in a precise north-south and east-west pattern, is not merely aesthetic, it's a foundational element of their water management success. This rigid, deliberate urban planning facilitated the easy, gravity-fed flow of water and sewage. They didn't have to navigate winding medieval alleyways. Their city was a well-organized circuit board for hydrology. Every house, every public area could be connected efficiently. You recall the streets you walked earlier. Remember that subtle, almost imperceptible slope? That was intentional, designed to guide surface runoff and sewage toward the main conduits. Historians still argue whether the Great Bath and similar large water structures represent an early form of state control over essential resources, or if they were communal infrastructure managed by powerful merchant guilds or community elders. Whatever the internal politics, the external reality is that you are standing in a city where clean water and efficient waste disposal were prioritized from the very first brick. You gaze up at the high walls of the surrounding structures and realize the entire city was built to manage water, bringing it in from communal wells, using it, and then meticulously routing the dirty water out. This is a level of sophistication that genuinely throws a gentle, sarcastic elbow at many European towns until well into the 18th century. Leaving the citadel, you head back into the lower town, the residential area, where the true genius of the IVC plumbing becomes intimately clear. You are now inside the ruined walls of a typical two-story home. This isn't the palace of a king, this is a standard middle-class residence, and it has something that would make a Roman emperor green with envy. Private sanitation. The first thing you notice is the well. A mainstream historical fact is that almost every medium to large house in Mohenjo-daro had its own private, corbelled brick well. You peer down the shaft, realizing that not only did the residents have easy, on-demand access to water, but the wells themselves were built with tapered bricks to resist the lateral pressure of the surrounding soil, a complex engineering decision. This decentralized water source meant residents weren't reliant on a single vulnerable central tap. The water security was built into the home itself. Walk across the small courtyard and you come to the latrine. It is a raised platform, often with a large sloping ceramic basin or a permanently installed terracotta commode with a small hole in the floor. Below this, running right outside the wall, is the key. A narrow drain. This is the quirky or fringe tidbit. Many of these private toilets were flushed manually by pouring water from a nearby jar, an early precursor bucket flush system. The waste was immediately routed through small feeder pipes and channels out of the house and into the municipal street drain. Imagine a private toilet in 2500 BCE. 
Meanwhile, many of their Egyptian counterparts were still using large clay rings set into the ground and covered with wooden seats, a system far less hygienic and less integrated into the civic network. Now, follow the water's path. As the waste leaves the house, it doesn't just splash into an open ditch. Look closely at the connection point. You see pieces of expertly crafted, fired clay pipes, some tapered to fit into each other like modern PVC, used to move water under the house walls and connect to the main drain. This is a critical technological step. They weren't just using bricks, they were using ceramic conduits specifically designed for fluid transport. These pipes often featured removable sections or traps, showing an understanding of drainage maintenance. Historians still argue whether the uniformity of domestic plumbing suggests a high degree of state oversight in construction codes, or if it simply reflects a highly effective trade guild that replicated a successful design across the region. But the result is undeniable, a clean and efficient system. Remember that 1 to 2 to 4 brick ratio from Section 1? It appears again, ensuring all the components, the drain covers, the well lining, the house foundations, fit together seamlessly. It's a testament to planning. You can almost hear the gentle clink of the clay jar water hitting the ceramic basin, washing the waste away quickly and efficiently, preventing standing water and minimizing disease a luxury that would disappear and reappear across human history like a forgotten memory. We are now going deeper, literally. You leave the private residences and return to the main avenue. If the Great Bath was the IVC's jewel and the house drains were its capillaries, then the Main Street Sewage Superhighway is its aorta. You squat down, pushing aside a large, heavy stone slab, the drain cover, to peer into the darkness below the street of Harappa. The smell is minimal, surprisingly, which is a testament to the system's efficiency. You can see the sheer scale of the operation, a brick-lined channel, often over a meter wide and nearly two meters deep in the biggest thoroughfares. This is the mainstream historical fact that clinches the IVC's title as plumbing pioneers. Their drains were massive, meticulously built and, crucially, covered and sealed. This covering prevented disease vectors like insects and rodents from accessing the waste, a radical public health measure for the era. The heavy cover slabs, some so massive they must have required several people to lift, also kept the noxious odors underground, contributing to that surprisingly clean air you first noticed. Now, you have to imagine yourself crawling into this dark tunnel, the air cool and slightly damp. You can clearly see the expert bricklaying, sealed with that waterproof gypsum mortar. The quirky tidbit here is the evidence of intentional maintenance. Every few meters you see an inset step or a slightly larger access point in the side wall. These were manholes designed to allow city workers and perhaps the occasional clumsy archaeologist to enter the drain for cleaning and sediment removal. They understood that a sewer system is only as good as its ability to be maintained. They even had wooden screens or traps placed at certain points, like primitive fat traps, to prevent large solids from clogging the system. As you shine your light down the length of the drain, you notice that subtle, constant downward tilt. This is the real engineering marvel. The gradient was calculated to be just steep enough to carry the sewage quickly and prevent it from stagnating, but not so steep that the flow would erode the brickwork over time. This use of controlled, subtle drainage gradient across the entire city plan demonstrates an advanced knowledge of fluid mechanics. You remember the city planning we discussed. That straight street grid made achieving this consistent slope much easier than trying to grade a winding lane. Historians still argue whether the consistent flow gradient suggests the use of advanced surveying equipment, perhaps based on water levels or simple siding mechanisms, or if it was a sophisticated body of knowledge passed down through generations of specialized civil engineers. Whatever the method, the result is that all the house runoff, 
all the Great Bath overflow and all the stormwater eventually converged into these massive arteries, which then channeled the waste out to the agricultural fields surrounding the city, where it could perhaps be repurposed as fertilizer. You emerge from the drain, wiping the imaginary dust from your tunic, feeling a deep, gentle respect for these ancient urban planners. They solved the problem that would plague cities for millennia to come, and they did it with baked clay, mortar, and brilliant math. You stand now at the edge of the sprawling ancient city, watching the main channel, the superhighway you just crawled through, disgorge its contents away from the urban center. The flow is steady, disciplined, a final testament to the city's masterful water discipline. The civilization, however, did not last. Like the flow of a great river that subtly shifts its course, the Indus Valley culture eventually faded. A mainstream historical fact is that around 1900 BCE, the major cities like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro began to enter a period of gradual decline, a process that saw their meticulous maintenance standards, including the plumbing, begin to slip. The standardized brick ratio faltered, the drainage covers were sometimes reused for crude buildings, and the carefully managed street levels rose, causing the perfect gradient you admired to be disrupted. Historians still argue whether the decline was primarily due to climate change, such as the drying up of the gagar hakra River system, leading to mass migration, or if it was caused by social and political changes, like external influences or internal strife. The simple, elegant truth is that the advanced plumbing, the very thing that made the IVC so unique, couldn't ultimately save them from broader ecological or societal pressures. You look at the final discharge point and realize even the best plumbing system in the world can't overcome a drought or a breakdown in governance. A quirky or fringe tidbit is that in many of the later smaller settlements attributed to the IVC's final phases, archaeologists find evidence of a curious backslide. The residents started building their new structures on top of the old covered drains, effectively blocking them or causing them to break, leading to inevitable sanitation issues. It's a sad metaphor for a civilization slowly forgetting its own best practices, a failure of memory over a failure of technology. We've seen the great bath with its bitumen seals, the private toilets flushed by hand, and the massive, covered, maintainable sewage superhighways. When you compare this legacy to that of contemporary Mesopotamia, where city streets rose dramatically over time as people simply built on top of the accumulated waste they threw out, the IVC's commitment to hygiene is truly astonishing. They had the foresight to manage water not just for survival, but for quality of life. You start your slow walk back, not through the ancient streets, but up through the layers of time, feeling the ground beneath your feet steady and familiar again. The sheer weight of those five millennia begins to settle on you, a gentle pressure that slows your pace. The images of those perfectly laid bricks, the subtle slope of the drains, the silent empe well in a forgotten home, they begin to soften, their edges blurring like watercolors in the dark. Take a slow, deep breath, letting the clean air fill your lungs. The sound of the wind down fan, the distant traffic, the gentle settling of your own home, that's all that matters now. The ancient engineers of the Indus Valley did their job, and now their work is done. You are safe, you are clean, and you are here. Let the last image you hold be the dark, silent flow of a brick-lined drain, doing its job perfectly, carrying away the past and leaving a clean slate for the future. There's nothing more to worry about now. You can let go.